cloud sounds like perfect there we go thanks all right so welcome to the november meetup for the oas bay area chapter my name is brendan higgins uh, i'm one of the leaders of the chapter we've also got wendy and prashant i think is still on here too two of the other leaders uh we're very happy to have you here today um as always we've got some great content a uh, couple of ground rules we want to go over and a couple of thank yous for for previous uh, sponsors and hosts uh, let me get my right there we go um <clears throat> Code of, code of conduct. We just put this up there to say, that, okay, you know what? Be kind. The people that are coming here today um, are sharing their knowledge and their experience with you for free. Nobody's getting paid for this. This is a community event. Be kind in your comments, especially in the chat and in the questions that you ask. Um, and if you feel that uh, that's not happening, let us know and we will deal with it immediately. We do not tolerate that kind of behavior. This, this is a safe space. Uh, speak up, be open, share ideas with each other. Um, you can connect with us, uh, obviously, on Meetup. If you're here, you probably did that already. Uh, we've got the, all the socials there, the YouTubes and the LinkedIn's and the Twitters and the, all the other things that I'm not on. Uh, so you can interact with us in those forums. Um, shout out to uh, some of the companies who have helped to support us over the last few years. Without the, this kind of support, our chapter wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be able to put on these kind of events. And hopefully we can get back to the in-person uh, meetups and hosting soon uh, because we've had a lot of people host us. And it's really great to go to another company. You know, everybody's hiring. So you get to put your banner up there and say, hey, come talk to us afterwards. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. And Wendy, if you want to introduce your speakers, we'll take it away from there. Sounds good. And today we actually have uh, two great speakers. We have Chuck D, who's an engineer manager at Datadog. And she'll do the first talk, which would be From Gates to Guidance, the New Face of Application Security. And we also have Satish giving the second talk. He has 15 years of experience in or expertise in application development, threat modeling, and security design analysis. Um, and he'll be talking about threat modeling, web application on premise, and on cloud AWS. And with that said, um, go ahead, Trupti, and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, do you guys see my screen okay? Yes, yes we do. Awesome. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to all the Bay Area OAS uh, chapter volunteers, Wendy, uh, Evan, uh, Brandon, and Prashant. Thank you very much for offering this opportunity. And I also would like to express gratitude to my manager, uh, Jonathan Bushnell, for this amazing idea. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Christine, who is my colleague and manager for threat detection and hunting at Datadog to be here. If you guys have any question, feel free to send those questions in the chat. And uh, Christine has graciously agreed to respond to those questions immediately. With that, uh, let's begin. Uh, before I start, just FYI, Datadog is hiring. If you're interested in exploring the opportunity, please visit the link. Uh, a small disclaimer, all the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are mine and they have nothing to do with the employer, although we share the philosophy. And all the references provided here, I have uh, tried to provide credit for the images uh, that I have borrowed from other resources. Little bit about me, I'm the engineering manager at uh, Datadog. I oversee two areas, application security and software integrity and trust. Software integrity and trust is mainly responsible for providing cryptographic protection uh, throughout Datadog's uh, software supply chain. And application security basically deals with security design and guidance. The talk is actually about the second team. When, um, I began my career, uh, I was a mobile game developer for almost a couple of years. And then I realized that my true passion is information security. So it's been 15 years I'm doing product security. I had a, a privilege to attend Johns Hopkins University's uh, master's program in security engineering. And since then I have worked at numerous organizations including Illumio, Amazon, Q2E Banking and HP. When I don't do security, I like to travel and take nature walks. 
um, just to manage the stress associated with reactive world of security. Uh, I ended up having yoga teachers training five years back and it truly helps me cope up with stress and it has improved my work-life balance and integration. Uh, just FYI, I'm also open for mentorship opportunities. So those who are new in the field of applied cryptography or AppSec, happy to help. If you need to reach out, uh, this is the way to contact me. Uh, feel free to send me email or connect me on LinkedIn. Today, I will be talking about what's the background and context uh, for this particular topic from gate to guidance. What's the motivation? And if you don't follow approach like this, what are the inherent risks? And then I want to explain um, the philosophy translated into more into practice, what gate to guidance means. I will also share some of the results. And last five minutes we can have for question answers. But if something comes to your mind, feel free to send it to the chat window. So let's begin with the background and context. Um, the main reason for this topic uh, is as the world of software is evolving, we need to make changes in the way we do security. If you look at the diagram or picture on my right-hand side, what do you see? You see a human who actually has a body and eyes are like robo. Somebody is doing iris scanning and trying to gather some information to probably run analytics on it. I would recommend you guys to keep in mind this particular image. As humans are evolving, we still have a lot of parts which are probably same as our ancestors' apes. And as we are becoming more and more smarter, we share some of the traits with the future generation that we are uh, you know, trying to create, the robots. Now apply all this to software evolution as well. Today, we have even more remote and distributed teams. And especially during pandemic, that's a great challenge. We have to work in different time zones. We have to learn each other's culture. We have to be mindful of each other's lunchtime and whatnot. We have been working a lot more harder than before. Connectivity is also very different compared to 15, 20 years back. Uh, we want to be connected via all sorts of different devices. And this has definitely affected the way we do security. I have a very detailed uh, slide on distributed architecture and how it has actually affected the software lifecycle development process. Instead of waterfall and ancient version of agile, today we kind of opt for fast feature driven development. And that's because uh, we want to generate the shiny new features and ship them quickly, get customers feedback so that we can generate revenue. And this affects security a lot because security needs to be as fast as the feature development process. Next trend I have seen is analytics everywhere. No matter what company you work for, people like to gather analytics. They like to make data-driven decisions. And when we talk about analytics, we have to focus on PII data and privacy concern. So that has affected security discipline as well. Automation. We all are in favor of automation because automation is something that helps us to scale. And when automation goes wrong, it's like automation on steroids, big security incidents, right? So we have to be mindful of automation as well. And lastly, I want to call out user behavior. User behavior is changing. You know, an average uh, human's attention span is smaller than a goldfish. Goldfish has nine seconds and we have eight seconds thanks to our devices, right? So all these things are constantly affecting and software is evolving. And that's why we see a big change in security discipline as well. As you can see on this image, uh, you, uh, you can imagine how 15, 20 years back, we used to have giant monolith architecture base applications hosted in private data center. And then slowly the evolution kind of started 
we started having more loosely coupled service oriented application then we started having even more loosely uh, coupled or rather decoupled microservice oriented architecture and since last five years we are moving in the direction of serverless low code no code type of application so how does this really affect our security that is also important thing to consider ah this is a nice slide about how the software lifecycle development has evolved. We often think about waterfall model or agile, but we don't understand. There are so many variations in between waterfall and agile, they coexist. So when we work with different engineering teams, they actually have their unique STLC. And as a security professional, we need to blend with them. This is again, geographically distributed and remote teams, the people factor. Um, nowadays, especially with the introduction of pandemic, people are working harder, longer hours from their respective home. We all love the comfort, but somewhere we missed on the time zone differences. We don't necessarily get the cultural aspects. And um, that's why we are seeing a lot of attrition in the world of security as well. Uh, just like the other sectors. People are opting for more meaningful and purpose, uh, purposeful uh, job choices. And security world is not uh, away from this situation. Now let's see, with this changes in evaluation, uh, sorry, evolution, how this has affected the motivation to think about how to go from gates to guidance. But before get there, those who are new to secure lifecycle development practices, I want to cover the aspects around gates. So as we can see in many companies, the ancient SDLC gate system still uh, exist. Uh, it is kind of weaved in into processes, engineering processes, and these gates kind of become blocker to move to the next process. Now, this is the more detailed image where I have included the manual security assessment as well as some of the uh, testing approaches that we all adapt uh, to secure SDLC and we call them gates. So unless somebody, uh, the critical applications or the applications with high impact do not go through threat modeling or design architecture, uh, security professionals or application security teams have tendency to block them. And what is the impact of this type of gating culture? Uh, let me go to the next slide. Oh, this is another slide. If you are thinking about more Sec DevOps, we love to integrate our tools into CI CD pipeline and block the deployment if there are high critical issues so that we kind of force developers to fix it and um, slow them down to be very honest. So because of this type of gating approach, uh, what I have seen in my 15 years of um, career as a product security professional is, this type of gating approach is viewed as a watchdog approach by engineering. And many times security becomes bottleneck and kind of slows them down. Well, thanks to our first generation security scanning tools, they still take a lot of time and throw, a lot, and throw a lot of false positives. And many times these security tools kind of miss on uh, you know, context. And as a result, uh, we have large number of false positives and very few true positives. Overall, because of this type of practices, security is kind of viewed as hindrance to innovation that engineering like to pursue. They want to build, design, build, ship features very fast. And when these security processes uh, utilizing gates are not mature, they are not aligned with engineering, we see a lot of friction. Has that been your experience as well? This is also a very important attitude slide. Uh, when I was a brand new security professional, almost for first five years, I used to take pride discovering vulnerabilities I used to cut security tickets. I used to threaten my engineering teams, telling them if you don't fix it, how this can turn into a breach or reputation damage. But guess what? That type of attitude was not welcome. 
It really didn't help me then scaring my engineering teams. What really helped me afterwards is going from the whole gating watchdog type of approach to a more guidance-based approach. Have you ever noticed when a cop stops your car at the freeway and gives you a ticket how you feel? Now, just put yourself in a doctor's office when the doctor arrives with bunch of test results in his hand and discusses different remediation approaches with you, how do you feel? You feel more supported. You feel the doctor cares about you. The doctor walks you through multiple options, right? You feel the doctor can be trusted and there is no punitive feeling the way we get when we encounter a traffic police. That's the same approach um, I would like to advocate here. When you work with your engineering teams, partners, have a customer-centric communication. They are not only your stakeholders and partners, but they are your internal customers. Adopt design thinking. What that means is understand their pain points, their priorities. If they are low on resources, obviously they are not going to have time to fix vulnerabilities. Work with their schedules, help them prioritize things. And design thinking also involves uh, doing constant retrospective to learn from feedback. And that takes us a long way as a security uh, team or trusted security advisor. Again, uh, when you're integrating software security into engineering process, do not create those gates. Work with your engineering teams to find out the criteria, what makes more sense. Fine tune those security tools to avoid any type of noise. Be their trusted security advisor. Not only create processes and roll out right tools, provide them uh, security guidance in the form of knowledge base articles. And eventually, please host tons and tons of events. It could be lunch and learn, brown bags, hacking competition to create the DNA, security DNA into engineering culture. And lastly, I would say, speak the same language of SDLC. What that means is whatever uh, agile SDLC or prototype or fast feature driven SDLC they are using, whatever engineering tools they are using, Jira, Confluence, blend security into that rather than creating siloed approach. So when I implemented all of my ideas, how did security look like, the guidance way? Well, the engineering team uh, started looking at security as a service. On one hand, uh, I had security review teams and these team members would do something called security design ops. That means they would literally sit down with UX designer architects to come up with a secure by default design so that users will not uh, make mistakes from security or vulnerability point of view. They did a bunch of threat modeling, design reviews, along with the design ops team. Then instead of having a gated type of security scanning approach, we opted for continuous security approach, which would not necessarily block anybody, but kind of help them with fine tune high quality findings and actionable remediation guidance. Lastly, security testing was not done by the external or internal pen tester, but QA engineers and developer also learn to write unit security test cases, as well as abuse and negative security test cases. And all these test cases were implemented as part of QA automation framework. So overall, we kind of achieved the model of continuous security assessment and monitoring. On the other side, the secure development teams, they built guidance documentation, security best practices for any security issue they saw uh, across organization. And this really helped uh, to scale the security best practices. Usually engineering team, when they would approach security teams for consultation, if something is reoccurring, all we had to do is point out to the Confluence page. And this helped with the velocity at which engineering wanted to move. We ended up rolling out secure libraries for commonly occurring uh, 
problems. Not only this, we started securing the foundational development work uh, framework as well as the foundational security services. Lastly, uh, we use cryptographic mechanisms to secure the entire CICD pipeline to protect um, our developers' products from supply chain type of attack. With that, this is how we change the whole gated security type of approach to more a guidance way security as a service. With that, I would like to stop and see if there are any questions. Don't be shy, everyone. We have a Q&A pod and we also, you can put them in the chat as well, I suppose. Uh, we did one already about, can we share the slides, Shruti? Uh, yes, I will post the slides. Uh, I will hand over the slides to Brandon and Wendy, as mm -hmm. well as I will uh, share the slides on LinkedIn. Awesome. Um, if there are no other questions. I, I've got a question. Let me let me see if this uh, helps anybody else free their, their mind up. Um, what kind of... Uh, resistance did you run into with this change, either from your own organization or from, from R&D teams or engineering? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. So any change uh, is kind of hard to accept and any change takes a little bit time. So um, many people who do not understand the motivation or rational behind change, they just think, why are you doing duplicate work? Uh, especially foundational security service, uh, develop, uh, development teams who are into foundational security services. They feel like security team are doing their work, but that's not the uh, case. We have to get together, uh, build some rapports outside work as well, explain them why we are doing. It's basically to unblock them, to kind of empower them, uh, to be very honest. Uh, besides this, let me think, what other resistance I got? Um, many times when I fail to communicate uh, the new changes that are coming proactively, it becomes hard for people to switch to other way. So I had to make sure I over communicate. If something is coming four months down the line, then I make sure uh, everybody from bottom to down is fully aware. Um, I remember my very first hacking competition I launched, hardly 20 developers turned up and that was a bit disappointing. And then I learned PMOs had scheduled hotfix on that same day. So that was a great learning lesson for me. What I did for the next hacking competition, I worked with PMO and uh, release management office and asked them, hey, what's the day that will work for everybody. When do you not have releases? And I kind of shared my plan and the second one was successful. Suddenly from 20 developers, I had 80 developers attending, including VP of engineering and directors. So in order to introduce any change, I would say proactively communicate and over communicate. All right, we've got a few more there. If you want to, I don't know if you want to just kind of answer them in sequence. There's one in the chat pod and then there's five in Q&A now. Uh, sure. Uh, what is the success criteria metrics for new approach? <clears throat> well, one of the metrics or success criteria I like to track is decrease in remediation age. Earlier, uh, when I would share vulnerabilities and no remediation would happen, and uh, months after months, pen test after pen test, when I see same uh, findings coming up with this new approach, the guidance way, I saw the overall developer security IQ increased, and they knew how to remediate the vulnerability, how to fix it right away. So that was one of the things. Then besides security engineer, I saw that there was, um, that's my timer. Besides security engineer, developers and QA engineers use this knowledge to find more and more security issues. And eventually uh, after a few months, we saw there was sudden decrease in security issues because uh, many common vulnerabilities uh, developers were avoiding because they were getting kind of proactive guidance. The guidance turned into security requirements. 
um, security engineers participated in the story time and overall uh, we had a lot more proactive security controls than the way um, the gated approach would work. Let me go to the second question. Uh, what would say the best practices are for prioritizing vulnerabilities to remediate by risk? So I like to rely on the industry standard practice, uh, CVSS, technical severity scoring. Now, please mind, this is not a risk severity scoring mechanism, but the technical severity of the vulnerability. Then I like to sit down with engineering, discuss the vulnerability with them and understand what are the other compensating and detective controls are in place. What's the engineering value to fix the vulnerability? And based on that, we would assign the risk. So I would say discuss your prioritization criteria with engineering because it's going to vary from organization to organization. Um, the next question is, this is a big organizational transition. How many years did it take? You know what? Um, it didn't take those many years, uh, depending on how big is the organization? Many times what I have seen, the pilot was successful with the smaller teams or smaller department. And then I kind of rolled it out to different departments. And sometimes uh, in financial organization, what you will see is both the techniques coexist. So it really depends on organization to organization. Happy to chat with you offline. Does gatekeeping to guidance approach mean having the development in team more involved and have ownership with security aspects of what they are designing and building. Uh, yes, security is no longer the responsibility of security team. Uh, these days, ever since cloud security emerged, we look at security as a co-ownership. But as I said, uh, application security teams should not be, their responsibility should not be only to find issues and do pen test and code reviews and threat modeling, they need to get down, do hands-on coding and sit right next to development and help them uh, you know, with building security. So definitely there is shift left transformation, but it's little bit more than that. What are some of the examples of libraries you rolled out? So we rolled out some libraries for cross-site scripting, uh, then, uh, cross-site request forgery, and um, we opted for service mesh in order to provide mutual TLS. So depending on what technology stack is used by engineering or a particular team, we rolled out different libraries. How do you get some level of assurance that teams are leveraging the tools and processes that you are providing and not just ignoring you? How do you uh, know that your message is being heard by everyone that needs to hear? The answer is metrics, metrics, and metrics. We used to have 24 seven metrics dashboard uh, created in Jira and Confluence. Anytime remediation happens, vulnerabilities are getting fixed. We could see the numbers. Um, if it's not happening, we would do executive escalation and everybody had access to these dashboards. So that was easy. What is the ratio of number of security professionals, architect testers to SEC engineers to the number of application for successful implementation of this approach? Um, I would say, uh, you know, 50 to one behind every 50 developer, it's good to have one security engineer. But let me tell you, even that is not sufficient. Eventually we have to opt for security champions and security advocate program, and not only train the developers, but also TPMs, PMs, engineering managers and directors, make them our advocate and prioritize uh, the guidance approach. Have you noticed or have data that development teams are more likely to raise security issues on their own? with a non-blocking continuous security approach? Yes. Yes, this is true. I was amazed after rolling out the basic developer security training, we saw that our sharp developers and QA testers were logging security issue on their own, resolving them without creating any blockers. So that was amazing. Has this allowed you to see and catch gaps that you otherwise wouldn't? Hell yeah. 
these guys are so much more smarter. They have such an in-depth understanding of their own product and code that many times security engineers wouldn't catch issues and developers and QA engineers would do once you empower them with the right guidance and knowledge. I guess that's all. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, one more quick one quick in, in, the, in the chat for startups where there is less budget. Uh, what are the critical security priorities that they should take care of first in a secure SDLC? Uh, the first priority I would say is opt for a third party vendor developer security uh, training program. Uh, either security innovations command and control range or hack edu and educate your entire development force uh, with the uh, right security knowledge. And then the second step would be look for the right uh, tooling. Uh, any other question, Brendan? Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, okay. awesome presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And one last announcement. Uh, Datadog is hiring. We are looking for AppSec, CloudSec, uh, threat detection engineers. And if you're looking for change or just want to have explanatory talk, please pin Christine or myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'll make it a round of applause, but I guess I'm the only one who's not needed. <laughs> Okay, uh, Satish, you're uh, you're gonna you're up whenever you're ready. Uh, you're on mute. Take a mute. Oh, sorry. I can share my screen, right? Yeah, go yes. ahead. Okay. Uh, hope my um, uh, my screen is visible. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, let me. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Tr uh, uh, Tripti, uh, for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, I was uh, amazed by uh, actually the attention span. <laughs> that was quite interesting. Um, and so, and it was a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. So, yeah, uh, with that, let me uh, start with my uh, talk. It's on threat modeling. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks to all the uh, WASP uh, coordinators uh, who provide me, provided me this opportunity. Um, okay, with that, let me start with my slides. And I'm quite excited to give a talk over here. Uh, I was previously, uh, yeah, okay. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Satish. I have around uh, six plus years of experience, uh, six plus years in application development and 10 plus years in uh, InfoSec. Uh, previously I was uh, null and um, OS chapter lead in Bangalore. That was way back, sometime back in 20, 20, uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, I think uh, uh, Prashant uh, would know me <laughs> better. Um, so, and uh, um, these are my, if you want to contact me, you can reach out to me on my Gmail address and uh, my LinkedIn profile as well as my Twitter. Apart from um, security, I also um, interested in yoga, things which Tripti said. Um, so I didn't borrow <laughs> a thank. I mean, in fact, I borrowed uh, that from her slide. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Tripti. I mean, even I do a little bit of yoga, it really helps me um, to uh, I do better threat modeling, I would say. <laughs> um, so uh, okay, uh, that is about me. Um, let's uh, let's get going. Uh, okay, uh, something about this session. This session is mostly uh, uh, kind of hands-on. I would say I would uh, um, walk you through, uh, walk you everybody uh, through one scenario and how to actually uh, uh, do a. Uh, 
first model a system, then um, analyze and then come up with the threats, um, later mitigate that particular system, and then um, do the reporting. So I'm trying to do all these things uh, live, uh, finger crossed, uh, uh, because uh, I'm using ThreadDragon for all these activities and uh, sometimes sometime it becomes very sketchy. Um, hope everything goes well. Uh, yeah, just wanted to show how it would, uh, what would you be learning today? So what we are trying to do is uh, come up with a threat model uh, like this. Um, similar to this, let me take a report. So at the end of this session, you should be able to at least come up with this kind of uh, uh, DFT uh, data flow diagram, and then uh, list out, uh, understand, uh, I'll be spending more time on, uh, uh, one is this uh, tool. Also, how to uh, do a threat modeling using stride methodology uh, and how, uh, um, and some of uh, tips and tricks uh, uh, to make it um, faster, uh, things like that. So I'll be concentrating more on that. Um, and also what I see is uh, everybody talks about uh, uh, threat modeling, but nobody actually does it. I mean, I don't know, this is my perception, but but looks like not many people uh, want to do it mainly because uh, it is, uh, it gets a uh, little bit, uh, uh, scalability is an, an, an issue. It, looks, it needs a lot of time and uh, more people are needed. So there are a lot of things, but at least uh, this base process, which I'm trying to um, uh, show should be at least, uh, um, it should be very fast and uh, helpful. Um, so this section, I thought of, uh, uh, I, uh, this section is divided into uh, three, I, I would say one is, uh, I'll be covering basics. Uh, initially, I thought, okay, let me directly go to um, uh, the use cases, uh, the two use cases I'm planning, uh, one is, uh, uh, is on-prem uh, application and another one is AWS application. Uh, I thought of skipping basics, but then uh, it would be difficult to understand. So. Uh, my plan is to cover basics and uh, one use case for this session and based on the feedback and if it is really good, if it is helpful to everyone, uh, I would uh, take another session, uh, deep dive, uh, similar thing, but on uh, AWS, uh, uh, on AWS threat modeling. So uh, that is my uh, plan. Uh, so by this end of the session, you should come up with this kind of uh, model and uh, with all these information and you should be able to generate a report, uh, basically uh, save it as a PDF, send it to the uh, product teams for them to uh, work on it and then uh, fix some of them which, we, which, which they might have overlooked or uh, they did not do. So, uh, that is the overall um, plan for uh, uh, today. Let me get back to my slides. Okay, so with that, let me start with the basics. When it comes to um, uh, basics, first is. Uh, uh, um, uh, let's uh, just under, try to understand high level. What we are trying to, what, what would be our objective uh, when we perform a threat modeling? Um, so first is we need to understand uh, what are the high value assets? Um, assets and uh, what uh, am I most vulnerable to? And what are the most relevant threats? These, these should uh, be uh, some of our objects whenever we uh, do the uh, threat modeling. And uh, 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 when we do the threat modeling, next is uh, uh, the, uh, the types. Uh, what are types of threat modeling uh, can we do? One is, uh, I would say, defense centric. So whenever you try to analyze 
uh, it would be uh, either we try to do some kind of uh, defense centric uh, approach uh, one could be attack centric and another one is uh, asset centric so today uh, i'll be walking you through mostly on asset centric uh, asset centric uh, uh, approach um, uh, maybe we can see defense and attack centric uh, uh, sometime later uh, so my primary uh, uh, focus would be on the asset what is my uh, what i am trying to uh, secure from the threats um, so uh, that is the approach i would be uh, going with and uh, the threat uh, detection methodology uh, when uh, there are so many threat detection methodologies available uh, to name stride uh, pasta bast these are some of them uh, but for this session i'll be just uh, walking you through the basic one that is stride uh, which is uh, uh, which is quite uh, uh, predominant in itself and then it uh, uh it takes care of it's like 80 to 80 per 80 20 uh, concept i mean uh, 20% uh, time you spend uh, time on it uh, you can almost cover 80% of the risk contracts so uh, i'll walk you uh, with um, uh, stride uh, for today and uh, then uh, then processes uh, again uh, what we'll be trying to do is first model uh a scenario uh using uh, dfp uh, dfps and for uh, data flow diagrams uh we are using thread dragon as the tool wasp thread dragon um and identifying the threats how to uh, identify various threats and how exactly to apply stride uh, and what wasp um, thread dragon provides in this uh, uh scenario and uh, uh, of course mitigation and reporting so so before that i think uh, uh, some more basic uh, basics on in terms of uh, jargons uh, uh basic some of the threat uh, when it when it comes to threat uh, there are three types of uh, uh, threats uh, one is um, intentional unintentional and uh, natural uh, intentional are basically uh, some of the examples of spoofing tampering uh, injecting malicious code repudiation um this could be some of the examples but when it comes to unintentional uh, it's more of uh, um for example uh, leaving the front door open so these things are unintentional threats so uh, those are um, a few things i just wanted to bring it up and natural threats are like uh, uh, earthquakes floods these are uh, some of the natural uh, threats or the examples which i could think of um and uh, you should be knowing what is a threat agent uh, you know the uh, uh, threat agent like uh, uh, we have something called uh, hacktivist uh, script kiddies these are some of the threat agents uh, state sponsored attackers or cyber criminals uh, so uh, these are the threat agents uh, 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 which is uh, some of the jargon which i could think of and then what else uh yeah risk is just the uh measurement of uh, threat uh yeah so uh, this this is pretty much uh, basics i think um, should be fine uh, to understand whatever i'll be uh, covering for today uh okay with that let's me i'll take the questions at the end uh, it looks like i i mean i need to cover a lot so uh, maybe we'll have a, a q and a session later and um, let me start with uh, okay with uh thread dragon okay so thread dragon is available it is free uh, it's a wasp uh, uh tool anybody can download um anybody can um download and then use it so so this is one which i've already done let me take a new fresh copy let me uh, yeah start okay so you can just download from um uh, the the dragon website and then once you 
install. Uh, this is the desktop version. There are two versions. One is desktop, other one is uh, web-based. Um, so I think uh, I'm quite comfortable with desktop. Um, in fact, you can use the web-based uh, uh, if, uh, okay, let me give it a name. Okay, so as soon as you um, uh, create a new uh, project in uh, uh, Threat Dragon, you get uh, this kind of sheet. And then you can just uh, add a title. Today we will be, uh, it's, uh, today I'll be performing threat modeling on a pet store. Um, I took a simple example. Uh, I didn't want to complicate things. Uh, so a pet store basically it has got uh, um, a simple e-commerce uh, website, uh, which, uh, which is on-prem hosted. <laughs> on-prem hosted and uh, it has got uh, a payment uh, payment module it's a, it has got authentication module and uh, it has a, a database um, so uh, so these are the uh, things uh, uh, this pet store has and uh, how do we uh, go about doing threat modeling uh, you can just imagine a scenario where developers security uh, uh, team, they just meet up, they do a tabletop uh, exercise, they will understand the scenario. And then during that discussion, maybe this is what uh, uh, the diagram they'll come up with. Okay. Pet store. And it's Satish, it's a pet store. Okay, so now maybe. Contributor, Light Wendy. Okay, a new diagram. Let's do it. Okay, so save. After saving, you uh, get this kind of uh, icon. You just need to click on this. Okay, so now we have uh, uh, the actual where you can do the data flow diagrams. Um, so it, it looks like this here, right side, you see stride, CIA, uh, other methodologies to be working on stride. So this is a cool stuff, which I find. Um, I'll tell you later why it is uh, very helpful. Um, and then next, uh, okay. So whenever we try to um, uh, draw, uh, uh, come up with a data flow diagram. So there are multiple diagrams that can be uh, use case diagram, class diagram, sequence diagrams. So you try to analyze uh, during uh, the tabletop um, uh, exercise, right? If uh, if a particular uh, uh, a particular project is in the initial state, uh, uh, then you might have to just um, go uh, with the information you have. Uh, but uh, uh, but again, this threat modeling, it, it's not a one-time process. It just uh, continues throughout um, step-by-step. It has to be developed step-by-step -step, um, at least uh, uh, a few months during the uh, life cycle uh, of a, a product. Um, so uh, initial tabletop, uh, during initial tabletop, uh, um, exercise, you get to know that it's a simple uh, application. It has got a, a payment module. Uh, you know how it is. It, it has a database. So I would start with that first. I mean, uh, uh, so whenever you try to, uh, there is something called analysis paralysis, especially it happens a lot uh, during uh, threat modeling. So whenever you try to do too much of analysis, you end up nowhere. I mean, it just takes a uh, hell of a lot of time. Uh, and then, uh, and then it doesn't go further. Further, so I would always start with a small, uh, as a little basic information, come up with a complete structure uh, and basic uh, threads, then dig up uh, further. 
So um, I would call this as pet store threat model 1.1. This is not the final one, but uh, definitely this is 1.0. We can uh, keep on increasing based on uh, time you have. Time uh, uh, you have, uh, so you can keep on increasing and then uh, keep on building this particular uh, uh, data flow diagram. So, so uh, okay, let, let's um, get through the basics of uh, this tool. Uh, whenever uh, it comes to data flow diagrams, uh, there are a few common things. One is uh, this zero, it's a process as it says, it's a process. So processes, it could be any program, it could be a mod module, uh, things like that, that which does some kind of uh, action, I mean, some calculation, some action it does. So that is process. So anything related to process, we will uh, use this one and uh, store databases and uh, all those things. I think we can use, uh, we'll use this data store. When it comes to external entities, um, maybe it could be a browser or a user. Um, so they are, uh, they are represented by uh, this symbol square, I mean, sorry, rectangle. So uh, any program, it is uh, a circle. And uh, uh, for any data store, uh, if you want to store something, we will be representing that with uh, this kind of uh, 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 equal to a kind of a figure. And then this is the square for uh, external entities. So very simple, we'll keep it highly simple. And then data flow, uh, in which direction the data flows that could be represented by this. And uh, dotted lines are basically the trust boundaries. Okay, now let's start with uh, just uh, all you need to do is click on here. Yeah, you get a. Uh, so, okay, this is data store. I'll take this later. Okay, first start with an actor. So since it's a pet store application, definitely we have a interaction is through, uh, it's an e-commerce web uh, application uh, and uh, it is a monolithic application at this point of time. Uh, maybe we can do um, microservices and uh, AWS things later. Uh, at this point of time, uh, this application is a monolithic application uh, and it is on-prem hosted uh, uh, kind of application. So now, Actor, uh, I would call this as browser. Okay, so I'm ready with this. Next is, okay, uh, pet store. Again, it will be having the uh, registration. So registration would be a kind of a program. So let me take uh, this icon. So registration module. And uh, yeah, before that, let me keep it as a web application. So this is our static uh, uh, static application, or if you want to uh, browse through various pets, things like that. So I'll just uh, think this as a, a all other pages. So registration pages, I'll just keep it separate. And then let me take another one. And here, uh, login. Okay, so I have a browser, a web application, a registration, login, and uh, maybe a payment gateway. I mean, I'll take this as the. Okay, let me keep this guy as separate. So, just to. Okay. Um, payment. Okay, so this is payment uh, hosh or uh, shopping cart is better. And uh, a payment service. Uh, for the payment service, uh, let us keep it as uh, 
external entity. So anything to represent external, it is very simple. All you need to do is come to this. Uh, when you click on this, um, you can just make it as out of scope uh, because it is uh, external. So we have a browser, we have a web application, we have a login uh, page on the web application. There is a registration page and shopping cart and we have a database. So simple. Uh, so we'll uh, database, maybe account B. Okay. So very basic uh, uh, application to begin with just, and uh, there are a few things. See, this is save, <laughs> uh, looks like download, but yeah, this is save. You can click on this uh, to save otherwise uh, whatever you would have been lost. So this is ready now. Let's do the data flow. Um, so from browser again to application, all you need to do is you have to this uh, arrow mark is there, right? You just click on this. Uh, click on the web application. So if you see, it would have already uh, linked those two. Similarly, from here. Uh, a web application from here, I would say registration. So it's get, it got linked. And from here, I would say login. We have a data flow over there. And then after login, I would like to keep my shopping cart application. Okay. And then from here, it goes to payment service. Okay. So now there is something called trust boundary. Uh, trust, uh, trust boundary is like uh, uh, where your uh, uh, level of uh, privilege change. So that is uh, the trust boundary represented uh, this way. And I don't like to use this because it is very sketchy. <laughs> and then uh, uh, it's sometimes difficult to use it. Let me try this. Okay, yeah, I'm good. Work. Yeah, don't ever click on this side. Yeah, so this is a different uh, privileges level, right? I mean, this is a client, and then a, um, it enters um, a different uh, area of um, from low privilege to high privilege. So that is where we are separating by uh, trust boundary, and then yeah. We can have one trust boundary between this and registration because uh, we are trying to protect C and this modeling and uh, assets and right. So uh, throughout this threat modeling, our focus would be on how to. Uh, uh, so for us, the what is the primary asset uh, in this particular scenario? It is actually the database, the data of. Uh, um, users as well as uh, uh, the login credentials, all these things are uh, over here. So uh, login credentials, maybe payment details, everything is there in this. So this is our asset. So throughout this uh, process, we try to safeguard our asset, uh, basically this database by applying multiple layers of security uh, by performing threat modeling. Um, see, uh, so that reduces uh, a lot of uh, uh, things uh, in terms of we need not have to go for each and every risk available, vulnerability available to add and then give to the uh, product teams. Uh, if we, uh, I mean, again, as I said, analysis paralysis, you give some thousands of uh, risks and vulnerabilities to, uh, uh, to the product teams, uh, it ends up nowhere. Like, I mean, the first thing is they won't be able to uh, fix them all, that would, self, would become a project by itself. Uh, and then it is too much of, uh, I mean, nobody wants to do, but if you give the 20% uh, more asset centric, which really uh, is uh, um, of value, then definitely uh, things will happen. Uh, they will try to implement. Uh, so uh, it will be very helpful. So. Uh, this is our asset. We'll try to protect this our asset throughout our threat modeling project. 
So trust boundary. Yeah. Okay. So try to hold it in the center. That way you get a good uh, diagram. So this is the trust boundary. Um, so we are trying to uh, protect this asset, our asset account, that is account DB, which has got credentials, all the stuff. And there is one more trust boundary here. Oops. So as I said, this gives some kind of sketch. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, we are done with our uh, first data flow uh, at a high level. So keep it as uh, simple as possible. Uh, this is, as I said, uh, 100. Uh, for example, don't try to put everything. For example, uh, there are a lot of applications, right? In e commerce, even shopping cart, uh, cart itself will be having multiple modules. Just uh, don't go right away uh, to that high level. Just keep it high level, simple. Uh, what all the primary uh, components, uh, the database, and how it is getting interacted. Just keep it at that uh, uh, for your initial uh, drawing. Late, you can, once this is done, you come up with a kind of report and you have the complete template structure, everything's ready. Then deep dive into each one of them. This could have uh, multiple sub modules or login can have so many things, uh, single sign on, all the stuff. But uh, when you start any uh, initial, keep it very simple and then come up with the structure and the template first. So that way uh, you won't end up uh, into that analysis paralysis um, uh, zone. So now, okay, so we have these things ready. Now, uh, what is, uh, yeah, this, this is fine. Uh, yeah, now let's, let's, uh, let's uh, so first step is done. We are able to come up with our uh, first uh, 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 at basic high level uh, data flow diagram for a pet store. Now comes the actual uh, threat modeling piece. Now, how do we uh, perform threat model on this? Uh, and we are choosing stride for this. So uh, one thing which is very helpful uh, is, uh, I'll show you this table. This table could be very helpful. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, this threat mapping. So browser is one of the component, web application is one of the component. So come up with this kind of a table. So component versus threats. So that way it will become uh, much easier to do analysis. Okay. okay. So. Um, have the table handy. So now let us start with uh, uh, browser. What kind of threats can the browser uh, have? Okay, now here, so click on the browser and then you can directly uh, click on the stride here, right side. And then uh, you can do a manage threats. When you do manage threats, you will get um, like this one is stride per element. So it's always good to do stride per element. Uh, so when you click on stride per element, automatically it will show, okay. Uh, it's kind of a, a wizard, I would say. Uh, it, it would tell, okay, so in browser, what all uh, issues do you see? So you can, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, somewhere something is disconnected. Okay, yeah, let me before this cover, yeah, this one. 
So understand this concept, threat mapping to OWASP prop 10. So uh, stride is spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, uh, denial of service and elevation of privilege. So that is the stride. Uh, and uh, these are uh, and these are the basic threats actually, uh, threats which uh, uh, maybe uh, um, high level threats like uh, spoofing all these things. Now let's do a mapping with OWASP. What does spoofing uh, map to uh, OWASP top 10? So this would help uh, be very helpful. Um, so uh, spoofing uh, is uh, nothing but broken authentication in terms of OWASP top 10. Um, uh, so broken, broken authentication, it could be uh, some kind of session related vulnerability or um, uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, maybe uh, social engineering. Uh, your uh, website, is, uh, website could be, uh, uh, web, web, website could be impersonated. So things like that. So those things fall under uh, spoofing. Next is tampering. Uh, tampering would be a mostly injection kind of attacks uh, like excesses. Uh, so um, excesses and um, command injection, SQL injection, all these uh, categories fall under tampering. Repudiation. So a repudiation, uh, uh, when, it, when you map it to WASP top 10, it is like uh, insufficient logging and monitoring. They constitute for um, repudiation. Information disclosure, sensitive data exposure and security misconfig. That can be uh, information disclosure can be mapped to uh, these two thing kind of attacks in OWASP top 10. Uh, denial of service is again, uh, it's security misconfiguration and uh, sensitive data exposure components with uh, known vulnerabilities. All these three could be mapped for uh, denial of service and elevation of privilege. We can map it to uh, broken access control components with known vulnerabilities and uh, security misconfiguration. Um, so this table, uh, this I mean, this table would be uh, very handy. I mean, if possible, try to take a screenshot. Uh, so this is very helpful in um, performing uh, uh, threat modeling. And uh, uh, the last one is the mitigation. So what is the mitigation for if you find a spoofing kind of uh, issue, the authentication, uh, uh, tampering, what, what could be the mitigation? It's like uh, integrity, uh, authentication. And if you find repudiation, uh, uh, integrity and authentication uh, would be the uh, mitigation for uh, those kind of uh, threats. And uh, um, information disclosure, again, confidentiality, uh, some kind of uh, uh, cryptography, things like that, if you use, that would be uh, the mitigation. And uh, for denial of services, um, it, uh, I mean, you need to be, uh, you need to work on the availability kind of mitigations. And uh, similarly, for elevation of privileges, it is uh, authorization. So this table, if you uh, keep it, uh, uh, keep it in your dashboard or uh, uh, some place, it will be very handy. So now let's understand. So in browser, what all attacks is spoofing possible at the browser level? Uh, I would say yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, when it comes to, okay, spoofing, I would say, uh, what kind of spoofing uh, could a browser have? Uh, browser can have some kind of, um, uh, maybe if the uh, if it is not the latest browser or some patch is not there, there is a uh, uh, there will be an issue with the browser. So I would take this as uh, some patching issue. Or uh, I think uh, there is a uh, browser spoofing attack is also there. So spoofing. So what I'm trying to do in this uh, area is like, I'm trying to convert them to map to OWASP. So I see browser spoofing as one of the attacks. So I've added to that. And then here, when it comes to prioritizing, do you want this, your product teams to fix right away? See, that is where uh, 
the philosophy of asset centric or attack centric uh, comes into picture at this time for me uh, most important is uh, uh, to control my asset so I, i would rather keep this as medium uh, at this point of time uh, and uh, description you can the, i mean the best uh, place to get the description for this would be and this also will be very handy now since we have mapped uh, spoofing to authentication broken authentication so all you need to do is come here so you have all the vectors so the, all the details so you can just uh, uh, put prevention what are the attacks so so it's almost similar but yeah you, you need to uh, further add more information Uh, of browser spoofing what kind of uh, version it is things like that you can work on that uh, but this would give a high level uh, high level uh, picture so do this for remaining threats no. so when you say accept it will go to the next one so here if you see there are um, so here um, when you selected uh, that um, uh, rectangle component right so it is more of an external entity so automatically thread dragon it shows you uh, there is a possibility of either uh, spoofing or repudiation so th that's pretty handy uh, which i uh, mentioned earlier so uh, it doesn't go to tampering uh, although if you want to add tampering issues there will be definitely but uh, on an average um, so it will be only Uh, it would be spoofing and uh, repudiation uh, at uh, the external entity level so you can just make it medium uh, your uh, repudiation what kind of repudiation attack i can see in terms of um, browser i would uh, consider uh, impersonation website impersonation Personation. Okay, and you can just add a similar. I'll just go ahead with that now. So I'm done. So as soon as you add, so now we just threat modeled uh, browser component, came up with two issues, and it's uh, it appears like this. You can modify here and do things like right? uh, various things. So now let's get on to uh, here. uh from browser to web application what channel is this? is it encrypted that is next thing next question you need to ask if it is uh you can just click on this uh, okay once you click on this it will show is encrypted is over public network so uh you can just if it is uh initial design and the project has not started then you can just do the recommendation okay this has to be encrypted um uh, or if the project is already completed uh, then you have to create this as a find bin so in our case uh, they have implemented so i'll go with uh, is encrypted and it is for public network so that way you this will change a bit okay so now let me come to uh, web application so when it comes to web application let's apply stride now stride and uh, click on this let's click on stride per element so you will get all you see one of six so it will take through all because the programs controls the possibility of having all the accounts are more uh, all these threads are more so so now what kind of uh, threads this for a minute okay so i'll um, so let's understand this area now so now uh, see browser uh, we found few a couple of issues now when it comes to web application what kind of uh, uh, issue you might uh, foresee at the spoofing level spoofing means uh, if you see uh, we have mapped uh, spoofing to broken authentication so broken authentication here could be some kind of uh, um now session related issues or uh, 
Um, so here I don't see uh, it's a static uh, web, web application. Um, so I don't see much uh, under uh, spoofing. So I'll go to the next one. Okay. Okay, enough six. So spoofing, um, I, I don't none at this point of time. I go to, you can do a debated, not applicable, accept. Now next go to, um, this is tampering. Now is tampering possible uh, for a static application? Uh, if yes, what kind of uh, uh, tampering and what could be the severities? Yes, tampering is possible. Um, like uh, uh, the clear example would be XSS. XSS um, or some kind of XPath injection or XML injection, HTML injection, all this injection as possible. HTML injection. Okay, so now uh, coming to severity again, I have to think over what is uh, what I'm trying to, what is the centric I'm going to. It is more of uh, asset centric. So at this point of time, I would keep this as a medium. Accept. Next, it will show me repudiation. So uh, at the web application, at the static page level, does it have a, a repudiation kind of issue? Uh, I would, no, I don't see much. I'll just mark it as none. Say not applicable. Uh, accept. So next, uh, information disclosure. Now at the static application level, um, will there be any information disclosure when it comes to again elbow map? What is information disclosure? It's more of a sensitive data exposure and security misconfiguration kind of issues. Do I see such kind of issue in a static page? Uh, yes, there is a possibility. I mean, if the logs, sometimes if uh, exception handling is not done properly, um, then there could be a problem. But I would not worry at this point of time, uh, especially for static. Uh, so I would say not applicable and uh, keep it as medium, accept. And then comes the DOS. Is there a possibility of uh, denial of service for static pages? Yes, there is a possibility. So it could be high. Um, so I will go with uh, DOS. And what is the associated um, DOS? Yeah, uh, there could be attacks like, uh, uh, I mean, you can, uh, continuously, if uh, uh, it is not configured properly, um, uh, load balancing, basically load balance. I mean, if you try to, uh, you can bring down the site, right? Uh, similar style of service attacks where you can um, try to hit the URLs multiple times, uh, and then it could uh, it could end up. Uh, um, or getting red and then uh, stop the display. So there's a possibility of that. So uh, denial of service, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, again, you can pull the information, um, uh, customized information you can add or the generic information you would get from uh, any of uh, the scenario which you have mapped here. You can add that as part of this and then say accept. Okay, next it will ask you elevation of privilege, is it possible? Uh, yes, this is possible because uh, often um, at the static web page level, people use uh, is, um, JSON or JavaScript uh, and so many pages which, uh, uh, which could, uh, uh, which could uh, uh, be an issue. Uh, but the uh, severity, I would keep medium at this point of time. Uh, so JavaScript open source. Issues. Uh, so medium, accept. OK, so we are done with this component. So um, just to summarize what we did, we came up with the data flow diagrams. Uh, data flow diagram. Then we are performing stride on each component uh, uh, we have uh, uh, designed. 
So we completed browser, we completed web application, or we can go to uh, next is login. So, um, so when you click on again stride and stride per element, you would get this one. Okay, so now login. So login page, um, it gets a little bit uh, different over here. Um, does it have a spoofing uh, kind of issues? Yes, uh, it can have a um, spoofing, but I, at this point of time, not worried. Uh, I'll just keep it as medium. Uh, for login, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, this would be high here. So spoofing would be a major issue like uh, password uh, harvesting or uh, common password attacks, those kind of attacks or uh, um, um, uh, session um, issues. If it is locked out, there is definitely a spoofing uh, uh, problem. So this would be high and um, that is broken authentication. I would uh, rather consider Yes, session kind of issues. Uh, these are the yeah credential stuffing. All these issues are possible, right? Uh, so the, I can just credential stuffing could be an, a very good example. So I add this credential stuffing. Spoofing open high. Uh, these are the impacts. Techniques. Next. So next it will ask tampering. Yes, SQL injury, uh, SQL eyes, um, uh, SQL eyes. So now, uh, since mine is more of ascent centric, I'm more worried of SQL eye now. So I would always keep SQL eye at a high, ensure uh, there won't be uh, uh, SQL eye. So uh, that is the reason maybe I will keep it high. Uh, tampering, SQL injection is possible. So SQLI, accept. So next reputation, I don't worry much of much about reputation out here. It, uh, I would say not applicable, accept. Mm, information disclosure, uh, I don't worry about that. Yeah, it is applicable, but I have covered later, so it's okay. Elevation of privilege. Yes, I've covered later, so I just go with the next one. Okay, so now login is done. Now let me go inside further. Uh, so, just quick, quick time check, Satish. We're, uh, we're coming up on five thirty here. Um, okay. uh, yes. Uh, pretty much, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give me five minutes. I mean, uh, not five minutes, two minutes, I'll just uh, wrap up. It's almost uh, done. Okay, so uh, similarly, you try to analyze stride for each component and as and when you go deeper into your uh, components where your asset comes, uh, you would want to create a defense in depth, basically multiple layers of protection for to protect this database. Like uh, here, logging, you, you need to take care of uh, SQLite. So uh, those threats would become high. Uh, similarly, registration, there is a possibility of SQLite. Those threats, uh, you, you might have to keep the severities high. So uh, that way, uh, you can start uh, working towards it. So once you have this kind of, uh, template and structure, it would become very easy to further deep dive, add some more components to this, and then uh, uh, come up with uh, multiple vulnerabilities. So once all this thing is done, just save, go back, report, just save as PDF, desktop, save. Okay, so it would look like this. PDF, contributors, fetch store, 
and you have your uh, web store 1.0 with uh, browser so we have uh, all are in red because we have identified issues and then you have the details so yeah so uh, what would be interesting is going for the deep dive uh, spending more time on each uh, component and then uh, uh, finding different different various issues based on uh, uh, based on OS or uh, OS. So yeah, so, so yeah, this is uh, the overall uh, which I wanted to achieve. So I hope uh, I'm good here. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, thank you for uh, thank you for doing a live demo, so to speak, because this is uh, this is not an easy thing to present and have a you know a bunch of people looking over your shoulder essentially while you're working. So we appreciate you doing that. Also, uh, you know, OWASP projects. So you know, we like to represent our own our own work here. So this is really great to see that. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to see us do more of that. Uh, so I think we have some we have some questions in the chat pod at the moment. Uh, I don't know if you want to just kind of take them in order yourself. Or we can also read them out to you or whichever you prefer. Yeah, I can read to, let me start with. Do you think uh, we should change the naming convention for trust boundaries as we are approaching towards zero trust architecture as nothing is trusted in security. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I mean, um, yes, uh, nothing is trusted, but uh, then uh, uh, as I said, uh, this would, I mean, it's better to put trust in place. I mean, trust boundaries that way, uh, what we can achieve is at least uh, come up with a basic structure uh, and at least come up with a basic uh, initial threats. If we make it as a zero trust, then it's like, uh, it's a very exhaustive uh, list of threats which we need to handle. Uh, as I said, that 80-20 uh, concept, you, I mean, you should not spend too much time in threat modeling also. Uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, too much of analysis could, uh, uh, could end up the program or uh, things may not go well. Um, so for that reason, I would say, uh, it's better to have uh, trust boundaries and then come up with uh, 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 at least the high level issue uh, work. I mean, the 20% uh, one, which uh, affects around 80% of the uh, product, uh, is, can happen only if we have the trust uh, boundaries, things are taken care of. So. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add. Um that uh, zero trust uh, is a very big marketing buzzword. Uh, nobody is able to actually translate it technically what zero trust means, uh, especially when it comes to uh, access control, data in transit, encryption, and whatnot. Um, and second thing, even though we have zero trust, we still have to trust something. There is no such thing as 100% zero trust or 100% trust. So that's where trust boundaries become extremely important. So I agree with you, Satish. Uh, there was another one there further up a little bit about, um, you know, would you suggest to use commercialized tools like Threat Modeler or Arius Risk? I'm not familiar with that one myself. Or the open source tools like Threat Dragon or the, the Microsoft tool that's been around for quite a long time. Um, and some other people are using draw.io or, or Visio or just kind of doing it manually. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, threat model, my, yeah, I've used in threat model in the past. It is very uh, easy, but I mean, it's very expensive. Definitely if they could, uh, I mean, if the company could offer, definitely uh, that is a way to go. Uh, but then uh, the problem is uh, as, uh, the next level, you don't have control uh, on the next level. For example, if you uh, work on this thread drag and open source tool, uh, there is a very good possibility of uh, automating it uh, because 
once you save uh, uh, this diagrams, I mean, whatever the project you have done, right, it saves as .json file. And uh, I see a lot of potential to further uh, automate this process. Uh, so all those chances will be missed and then you end up, uh, 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 end up, I mean, um, it won't uh, see, it should be, it cannot be custom built that way. So, but if you use this open source tools and then try to integrate custom build to your uh, uh, products uh, and um, life cycle, uh, I think that would be a better approach, uh, I think. Okay, on, on a similar note, Greg adds that uh, he's written a, a Dragon extractor tool to take all of these threats and export them to CSV, which you then can easily import into Azure DevOps, Jira, okay. et cetera. So that's, that's cool. There are so many possibilities. I mean, uh, see, the next is like uh, automating these things. So yeah, definitely uh, it's uh, worthwhile to go this route. Um, then that, yeah. Cool. Another point Greg makes there is that the uh, threat dragging team, again, this is this is all open source, so it's volunteer work, are very responsive to feedback. So let's give them feedback. I, I personally, I think this looks great. I think it looks better than the other tools I've used before. Um, one more question. Um, do you always need DFD to identify threats and necessary development countermeasures? DFD, I assume, means data flow diagram? Correct. Not. Um... Not exactly. See, DFD, uh, it's a standard way uh, uh, people do things. Um, in fact, uh, there are a few people who feel uh, just a normal architecture diagram, analyzing that itself is uh, uh, better. Um, uh, but something standard uh, would be helpful, right? I mean, uh, if uh, somebody else is doing, uh, I mean, if you uh, change the, uh, uh, no, the standardized approach is uh, better, I feel. So yes, DFT di uh, diagrams are good. Okay. Uh, uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, if not, a separate okay. talk on zero trust. Uh, I'm just uh, reading Alex's comment, and yes, zero trust can mean so many things. We we have to go a little bit more deeper. Um, so I would like to be respectful of everybody's time here. Uh, would love to chat to you about zero trust uh, offline. Did you just volunteer to come back and do a zero trust talk for us? Why not? <laughs> That's what I heard personally. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I think these were these were two great talks. Some um, we were delighted to have everybody here come and listen to it. Um, we hope you come again. If you want to speak, or you know, in the future when we get back to the real world, where if you want to host, let us know. Reach out to us through the the channels, through the meetup, through LinkedIn, whatever you want, whatever way you can make it work. Um, because we're always looking for great content, great speakers, and then the more we get, the more we can do this because we really enjoy it. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great evening and we will see you at the next one. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Wendy. Bye. Bye, Bye. thank you.